afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the sixth stop on our Cross Canada exploration in partnership with Edwin. Over the last few weeks, we've been on some incredible virtual journeys across the country, meeting incredible scientists and conservationists who are predicting on the wild spaces and animals. Be sure to join us tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. Eastern for our seventh bonus trip for an event live on the field the location of which we are keeping secret. My name is Alexandra and I'll be your host for today's event. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to give a huge shout out to Edwin. They have put together some incredible curriculum material to utilize through this cross Canada um, exploration with your students. It's so great. I'll show the link right now if you haven't used them already. It's gonna show up at the bottom of your screen. And then uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. It's Tyler Wiest. Uh, he's, le he's a leading entomologist at Agriculture and Agri Food Canada, based at Saskatchewan. He studies the raging battle between good and bad insects that plays out in farmers' fields across Canada, from building mobile mobile apps to track pests on beneficial insects to answering why quinoa has trouble growing on the Canadian prairies. His research is based on some interesting insect relationships with each other and with plants. So it's my pleasure to welcome Taylor with me today. Hi, Taylor. Hey, everyone. hey how you doing? Thanks for nice. having me on the show, Alex. So we're going to start shortly with uh, Taylor's presentation, and then we're going to have time to play a quiz together. It's on Kahoot, so you're going to have the login details for that later. And it will be my pleasure to take questions from the audience on you folks afterwards. So put them on YouTube, go for it, and uh, then we can add them to Taylor. Um, so we're going to start very shortly with Taylor's presentation, and I'm going to share again the link if you want to access the material that we that had been at, has put together. So please go check that link if you need the material for that. I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. OK. so. It's your time to shine, Tyler. I'll let you um, share your slides, and then we're going to get started. Enjoy. All right. Thanks, Alex. Have you got it up there in presentation mode? Excellent. OK. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming to the uh, presentation today. My name is Tyler West, and I'm a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and I'm based in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And if you want to get a hold of me, Here's my Twitter handle there, and there's my email address. So I'm going to use the umbrella of field heroes to talk about things that we like to call field heroes. So what would a field hero be? This is a good bug that destroys the bad bugs in the field. And uh, Western Grains Research Foundation, in collaboration with Synthesis Agri-Food Network, has been really good about being a cheerleader for these field heroes. And so putting out informational packages about learning about these field heroes so that you can have short bits of information, easy to digest, easy to understand, easy to remember. And uh, so you can learn about field heroes and these, these, uh, these soldiers that are in your fields fighting for, um, fighting for your yields, basically. So this presentation we've titled Field Heroes in Canadian Farm Fields, and it'll have a real Western Canadian focus because that's where I'm based. But a lot of these insects are very common and we can find them in a few places. So let's start with, how does one eventually become a research scientist? So first of all, you have to go to university and you get a BSc or a Bachelor of Science or sometimes a Bachelor of Agriculture. This is called an undergraduate degree. Then after your undergraduate degree, which is typically around four years, you go back to university and you get a master of science degree. Then you go back to university and you get a PhD, which is a doctor of philosophy. Hmm, that's kind of a weird term. Really, it just means a doctor of the lover of wisdom. And so your doctor of philosophy is very, very specific to one thing. And I'll show you what I was working on in my doctor of philosophy. Then after you get this PhD and people can call you a doctor, you go and you work as a postdoc typically or a visiting scientist where you learn from another scientist how to run labs and do research. And then hopefully you become a scientist or a professor. And so I've got the scientist route there. 
So I became interested in insects and the interplay between the good and the bad insects when I was working for the city of Saskatoon in pest management. So here's me sitting down here on one of the machines that we were using to chase down mosquito larvae in the water called an Argo. And up here is a Petri dish full of Culex tarsalis mosquitoes. And so it's my job to count those. And those are a vector for West Nile virus, which really hit Saskatchewan hard in 2007. So it's a disease that was killing corvids like ravens and blue jays and can also kill horses and really do a number on people if they get infected too. On the trees, we had an infestation of these little insects called psyllids. And they wound up wiping out a lot of the black ash in uh, Saskatoon. So not a nice little critter to have around. Then when I was working on my Master of Science, I inadvertently was working on these bee flies, which are actually field heroes as well. So right now, they are good pollinators. They're pollinating this crop here called Echinacea. But in their larval form, their larvae eat grasshopper eggs, and grasshoppers are one of the worst pests of all of our field crops here on the prairies. And so the bee flies are beneficial at their adult stage when they're pollinating, and they're beneficial at their larval stage when they're eating grasshopper eggs. And we had just had a really big grasshopper outbreak when I was doing this project, and uh, the bee flies were very plentiful. So also during my Master of Science, I was working on the nectary and the nectar production that was uh, coming out of these echinacea plants. And so this is a nectary right here. And so this is food for all of those insects that we call pollinators. It is a syrupy sweet liquid that they lap up for energy. And so I got to take some really cool pictures of the outside of the nectary using scanning electron microscopy. And then the inside, and we can see individual cells here. And what we found was that the nectar was coming directly from the phloem cells, where the nectar would just leak out and pool in this area here for those bee flies to come and drink. And then I got to do some really cool stuff called transmission electron microscopy. And here we're seeing the organelles inside of the cells. So very cool stuff there. This one I like. So this is called pareidolia, where you see faces in nature when there aren't actually faces there. And these are two stomata on the side of the nectary, and it looks like a, an old man's face here smiling at us. I just thought I'd throw that in for effect. So I also looked at pollen. And so this is asteracea pollen, and aster, it means star. And so this, the pollen grains actually look like little stars as well. So you can see these pointy little stars here, and that's echinacea pollen. So I was studying how the pollen tube was going down and using that as a, as a way to determine pollination. So you can see these pollen tubes that are going down here, and that is how the pollen grain gets down and uh, fertilizes the ovule. So I did a PhD, and there's my lab mates right there. And I was working on this little moth that was attacking ash trees. And so this all came out of my work with the city of Saskatoon, where I got interested in the things that were attacking trees. And so they make these little pyramid-shaped rolls on the trees, which really makes the trees not look very good. And so while I was working on the moth, I was trying to figure out how they were attracted and when they were flying. And we found that their peak activity was just after sunset and right before the sun came up. And so that's when the females were flying around and laying eggs. But there was also this third trophic level of these hymenopterous parasitoids. So these are little wasps that were laying eggs into the caterpillars of these moths. And the main one was called Pantales polycrocitus. And that's a picture right there of it. So I'm gonna tell you more about parasitoids as we go along here. So after you get the PhD, I was working on a postdoc with Christelle Olivier at AAFC here in Saskatoon, and that turned into a research scientist position. So we get to use cool microscopes where I can have pictures of aphids like this, and with a little bit of Photoshop skill, you can put hats on them. I didn't do that while I was at work, but what's really interesting is this is a tobacco plant, 
And this is a plant defense against these aphids, which are here trying to suck the yield out of the plants. So they're feeding on the sugar solution that the plant is making, and the plant doesn't want that. So it's got these, these trichomes, which are little plant hairs, and on the end, <laughs> these little glue balls, and it is sticking this aphid. So the aphid is stuck to the plant, and it can't feed, and it just dies. So this is one way that plants can defend themselves against insects. So after my postdoc, I started working as a scientist on things like wheat midge attacking wheat, flea beetles attacking canola, pea aphids attacking pea, and all sorts of legumes, aster leafhoppers that were vectoring a plant disease called aster yellows into canola, and then pests of any new crops that are coming out. So you get a new crop on the prairies, and then there's a host of insects that we don't really know too much about. So lots of good learning opportunities there. And I really liked working on aphids. Here's an aphid here and parasitism. So when an aphid gets parasitized, it turns into something called an aphid mummy. I'll show you a bit more about that in a second. So Western grains really wanted to get the word out about these beneficial insects. And so they created this kind of cheerleader group called Field Heroes. So you can find Field Heroes online. You can find them on Twitter and the hat, the main point is think about those beneficials before you spray your crops because these beneficial insects can keep the levels of the dangerous the bad insects down by feeding on them so we'll use the term beneficial here what does that actually mean so a beneficial insect benefits humans by reducing the impact of those pest species so we've got two kinds of beneficial actions that work into biological control. We've got predators that eat them and parasitoids that eat them in a bit of a different way. So what we, what we were starting to realize that many producers and agronomists were not really aware of what these beneficials were, what they looked like. And, but the beneficials are vulnerable to the same insecticides used against the pest insects. So we wanted to help teach them using field heroes. So it started in 2017 as this awareness campaign, and uh, Jill Sauter has been the driving force behind that. And so it's a conversation starter. Hey, do you know about Field Heroes? And it's also a platform for connection. So it gets people talking about these beneficial insects. Here's one of our native lady beetle species. That's the 13 spotted lady beetle right there. So we pop up everywhere. We've got these Field Heroes shirts here and here. This was uh, at an event in Edmonton at Farm Tech, and we even took it all the way through to uh, to our big entomology meetings with the Entomological Society of America with John Gavlosky here and Hector Carcamo. There's Megan Bankowski, there's Haley Catton, Boyd Morey. This is Alberta Bug Counter, Scott Mears, and Shelley Barkley, who works for Alberta Agriculture. And so all of these people here contribute to uh, spreading the word about beneficial insects. And so they are all entomologists in their own right. So a lot of the work has been done on Twitter, where we get to post cool pictures like these uh, Therosticus melanarius ground beetles pulling apart a caterpillar, and little tidbits like, hey, what field hero can eat 135 aphids in 24 hours? Find out here. Guess what? It's a seven-spotted lady beetle. So also graphics like check the net so what might be in your sweep net when you're sweeping in a field hey if it looks like this might be a roof beetle might be a green lacewing and some fact sheets as well for some of the pest species like birth armyworm that attacks canola and aphids that attack pretty much every species out there depending on the species of aphid so let's talk about aphids aphids are a bad pest because they tap into the phloem that is creating the yield for the seeds and they basically suck it right out so this aphid is female and she is giving live birth to another female aphid so aphids basically clone themselves so their populations can get really big really fast because this aphid baby clone here is going to be doing the exact same thing in about seven to eight days depending on the temperature because there's no egg phase they start feeding right away and because they're all female, every single one that comes out can keep producing more and more and more. 
So in pulse crops, we get P aphids. Here's fava bean, and it's just covered by P aphids. And you can see that the plant is starting to wilt because of the, the uh, all of the water and the phloem and the sugar that's being taken out of those fava bean plants. So down here, this was one of my fields. The black sticks, that is where the P aphids were uncontrolled, and that is what they did to that field. Up here, we have, we have a crop called lentils, and P aphids are really hard to see in lentils. They were much easier to see when they're on the pods at the fava bean here. Now, when we went and harvested our plots, plots that we controlled the aphids in, we had some great yield, big pods, lots of seeds. And where we didn't control the aphids soon enough, we just had dead sticks. So this image on the right was taken right beside the image on the left. And from these plots, we got basically shriveled up and no seeds. And this is the yield monitor on the combine. All of these brown spots here are where the yield was basically zero. So in canola, we get flea beetles that come in. This is later stage canola. So the flea beetles are eating whatever is green. But when the flea beetles come in hungry and the plant is really small, they can eat these canola plants right to the ground. And so flea beetles are a really big problem in canola. Now, what insects are dealing with these problem insects in the field? So some of the common field heroes that we're going to find amongst all the different crops are parasitic wasps. And so here's an example of an aphid mummy. So it looks like an aphid, but really this whole body cavity has been taken up by the larva of a parasitic wasp. So how does this happen? Well, along comes this parasitic wasp. Do you see how she's tapping the surface of the of the aphid? She's tasting them, and then she fires out her abdomen, and she lays an egg inside each of those aphids that she's parasitized. So here she goes again. So these are really good field heroes, and you often do not see those female wasps in your field, but you will see the mummies that they leave behind. So this was about nine to 10 days after that initial sting where the female parasitic wasp laid her egg inside the aphid. Now we can see the parasitic wasp larva has completely eaten everything inside the aphid's body. And then they split the belly of the aphid and they glue themselves onto the surface that they're on. So that's what this one is doing here. It's trying to figure out where the surface of the leaf is so it can glue itself on. Then what happens about five days after that is that larva pupates inside the aphid and we get this aphid mummy and then we get from the other end, this is the back end of the aphid. These are called cornicles, these black tubes here. And they release an alarm pheromone that the aphid uses to warn other aphids. But what's going on here is that parasitic wasp has now completed its development and is cutting its way out of the backside of that aphid mummy. So it's using its mandibles to chew its way out and it creates this trap door that it's gonna pop open as it comes out of that aphid mummy. So there's the head of the parasitic wasp. And this one's called aphidius avinaphis, crawling out of an English grain aphid. And there they go right there. And so after this, she'll go off and she'll try to find more aphids to parasitize. So in our fava bean system with P. aphids, we actually had a different species of parasitic wasp. And instead of staying inside the aphid mummy, it crawled out underneath and it pupated underneath like this. So you get these things that look like white aphid mummies instead of brown aphid mummies. And then you see these orange aphids here, they've actually been overcome by a fungus. So when the canopy is humid enough, Aphids can be attacked by a fungus that winds up killing them. So that's another field hero. Sometimes though, we don't get the primary parasitoid coming out of these aphid mummies. We get a different wasp coming out. So this is called a hyper 
parasitoid or a secondary parasitoid. And it is a parasitoid of the parasitoid of the aphid. And so in terms of field heroes and control of aphids, these are actually bad for the control of aphids because they're reducing the number of the parasitic wasps that are emerging and being able to attack that next generation. Here's a diamondback moth being attacked by diadegma. And so caterpillars can be attacked by parasitic wasps as well. So the parasitic wasps are always very specific about what they're attacking, except in some cases. And so diadegma um, is one of those ones that's not that specific, but really likes to attack these diamondback moths. And so this is a picture that Tim Haya took, a very good picture. So that's why I'm using it here. So my colleague, Vincent Hervé, he's a research scientist in Morden now. During his PhD, he studied a parasitic wasp called Cutesia. Cutesia is really interesting. So here's a Bertha armyworm just minding its own business here. And uh, along comes the parasitic Cotesia. And you can see what she's doing there. She's laying one single egg into that Bertha armyworm. The Bertha armyworm has no idea what's coming. So here's that egg being laid. We can't really see it, but you can see her abdomen there. And then the Bertha armyworm says, okay, get out of here. Now, inside that Bertha armyworm, that egg splits many times. And then here is a cabbage looper, so another one that Cotesia can attack. And it doesn't look very good. Caterpillars usually are not this sickly white color. Draw your attention to these little spots starting to form here. So Vincent had this worked out so he knew exactly when these parasitic wasps would start to emerge from the caterpillar. So you can see that the caterpillar is still alive and doesn't really know what's going on. Inside, the egg of Cotesia has split. And so what we're going to see are these clones. So the larvae are all clones of each other. And they are bursting out through the body wall of this poor caterpillar. So you can see them all coming out right here. And this process doesn't take very long. So now they're moving their heads back and forth like this. And what they're doing is they're starting to spin a communal cocoon so they're all going to pupate as soon as they emerge from this poor cabbage looper you can see the cabbage looper is still alive so i'm just going to move it forward a little bit and there we have most of them coming out and now what we've got is that communal cocoon starting to form and what the communal cocoon does is it protects um so if a predator came along and ate one or two of these the other ones would be safe from that predator because they couldn't possibly eat all of these at once. And then they sort of sacrifice themselves for the sake of their sisters, which have the exact same DNA as them. So that way they can ensure that their DNA gets into the next generation. And you can see the caterpillar is starting to get away. So caterpillar is still alive and can be for days after this event. And this poor little Cotesia here didn't get out in time. And so it won't be in that communal cocoon. So the wheathead armyworm is a pretty bad pest. It's sporadic in wheat fields, so we don't know a lot about it. But this picture here by Dan Johnson shows how badly a, a kernel of wheat can be damaged. So one of these wheathead armyworms can destroy a whole head of wheat while they're feeding overnight. So I've got them, got them on barley here just to show you how they're pretty well camouflaged with uh, the senescing barley. They get attacked by a Cotesia as well. So the clusters look a little bit different, but each of these cocoons is going to yield a parasitic wasp. You can see that the tops here have been cut open and the parasitic wasps have already emerged. So you can see that they sort of look like they've been uh, pupating in the shape of a caterpillar there. And so just like that last one we saw, all of these Cotesia burst out through the body wall of the, the uh, wheathead armyworm there. And just like that last one, 
this one's crawling away and we've got one little larva that just didn't quite make it. So there's that Cotesia cluster that we're finding in the fields. So if anybody finds anything like that on their uh, wheat head or their barley fields, you can definitely send those to me. And I would love to know what species we have all across Canada. And here's what the adult looks like. So flea beetles get attacked as well by a parasitic wasp. So here's a really good look at a parasitic wasp. This is the ovipositor. That's what she's going to use to lay the egg into the flea beetle if she's successful. You see how she's very cautious here? Flea beetles have these really big back legs and they use them for jumping like fleas. Uh-oh, that flea beetle knows that here comes the parasitic wasp. So she's trying to sting him with her ovipositor there. She's got it ready. Again, that flea beetle's not having any of it. So she's slowly trying to sneak up on the flea beetle. Now, these parasitoids, they only do 2.5 to, 2 to about 5% damage to the population each year. But we're finding there's some pockets where there's more of these parasitic wasps coming out of the flea beetles. So that's exciting. Now, this kind of looks like a slug, but it's actually the larva of a fly called a hoverfly. And so it's got an aphid right here, and it is eating that aphid. So that term that we use is aphidophagus. That means I like to eat aphids. And here is one eating the aphid. You can kind of see that it's almost got this stabby mouth part here that's just poking into that stomach of the aphid and hollowing it out so we can see legs and we can see the cuticle of the aphid, but it's been pretty much all consumed by this hoverfly larva. Then we have some beetles that go, go after aphids as well. These ones are called the soft-winged flower beetles. They're in the genus called Colops. And they can eat about 54 P. aphids in a day, which is great, or over the whole lifespan. So this one here has two spots. So it's a different species than this one that has two lines. But we both we find both of them in the same fields feeding on aphids. Down on the ground, we have field heroes called ground beetles. And so here's the ground surface. And this callosoma or caterpillar hunter has a birth army worm gripped in its jaws. You can see the big eyes on callosoma. So these are visual predators that like to see their prey. And they're very fast, running along the ground, chasing down any pest insects that might have fallen from the canopy. And this was a picture from Vincent Hervé again. He did some great photography of field heroes. This is a picture that I took. And this is a Bertha armyworm being destroyed by these ground beetles here called Terosticus melanarius. And so, yeah, that is their food source. They're eating that Bertha armyworm. These are the eggs of lady beetles. And so lady beetles are one of our top predators, definitely of aphids, but they eat other soft-bodied insects too. And this is an aphid larva, and it's eating an aphid in this. Sorry, a lady beetle larva, and it's eating an aphid in this case right here. So in our wheat fields, we usually get the seven-spotted lady beetle, and so these are seven-spotted larvae. Then after they're done eating aphids, they'll pupate. And they don't do any aphid eating while they're in this stage because they don't have a mouth. So this is like the cocoon or the chrysalis of a moth or butterfly. So they go through complete metamorphosis and then they change into an adult beetle. So if you count the spots, we have one, two, three here, three on that side and one in the middle for seven spotted lady beetles. And here's some eggs hatching into first instar lady beetle larvae. And then they get bigger as they go up. And this is a a late instar larva, and then there's some pupae on the faba bean plant. And then the pupae become adults, and they actually overwinter in the adult stage. And so in the springtime, the seven spotted adults will be out looking for food again. So let's have a look at what those, those uh, larvae do to aphids. So here we go. So it is a predator that completely eats the aphid. So that aphid is not left behind at all. And look at this. We've got these little yellow droplets coming out of the cornicles of the aphid. And those are alarm pheromones that that English grain aphid didn't really seem to care about. So another predator that we'll find in fields is the green lacewing. So the adult of the green lacewing, when you get it in your sweep net, 
it smells terrible. <laughs> and that's a defense so that no one wants to eat it. And it's really worked because I've never eaten a green lacewing adult before. So here they are up on the heads and they will eat aphids, but their offspring, the larvae of the green lacewing adult, they are ravenous feeders. So here's an adult eating a pea aphid and only a few species of the adults will eat aphids. So they're not a big predator, but here's what the larva looks like. And I'll draw your attention to its big mandibles on the front of its head. So here goes that green lacewing larva with these huge mandibles. So it looks at this small aphid on the side and it ignores it. And it goes after the big aphid because why wouldn't you want a bigger meal? So check out the aphid's response. It releases these droplets here called defensive droplets or alarm pheromones. And this aphid is starting to react to the smell of the alarm pheromone. And it is leaving the scene of the crime so that it is not eaten next. So this process here, the green lacewing, we sometimes call them aphid lions as well for the way it's kind of shaking that aphid and holding it up above its head. Um, it is injecting a digestive enzyme into the aphid, which liquefies the inside of the aphid so that the green lacewing larva can suck out the liquefied aphid juices. So with, uh, yeah, here's a close-up of those mandibles. And that lacewing larva has skewered that aphid right there and is digesting it. And one of these larvae will eat about 30 aphids a day but they leave behind the exoskeleton of the aphid. So you always know when a green lacewing has been at work because there are little shriveled up bodies of aphids everywhere. Now here's one against a cabbage looper. So this was the start of the attack. The cabbage looper looks pretty good. At the end of the attack, the cabbage looper is all liquefied and has been sucked dry. So what we've got left behind is just the exoskeleton of that cabbage looper and a happy green lacewing larva who just had a big meal. Now the green lacewing is such a top predator that when the mom lacewing lays eggs, she lays them on the underside of leaves on long stalks so that when the green lacewing larva hatches, so when the first one hatches, it doesn't just go around and eat all of the eggs of its brothers and sisters. And so it drops off the plant and then can't get back up to eat the eggs. So that's a way of preserving her uh, offspring. This is what the cocoon looks like of that green lacewing. So other things that you might find in your field protecting is our spiders. So you can have ground spiders running on the ground, but these ones sit in the canopy and they spin webs. And this is called the long jawed orb weaver spider. And then any insect that blunders into their net gets eaten, like this one over here in the corner. So if you want to know more, Ag Canada has actually put out a uh, field guide to the forage, to the crop and forage pests and their natural enemies in Western Canada. So the pests take up the front of the book and the natural enemies take up the back of the book. And you can actually download this for free from the government website. So. I'm going to open it up for questions now. There's my Twitter address again, in case you have questions after the show to ask me. And I want you to think beneficials before you spray. And uh, thank you very much for having me on the show today. Was I on mute the whole time? You were on mute. That's okay. Of Say course. Again. So, I, was, I was saying that <laughs> we, it's time to play the cow together. So I invite you to log in using this uh, code number uh, when you log in on the cow uh, IT. Um, and then we're going to play the game very, very soon. So please log in and we uh, will answer questions that you folks have put in the chat uh, on YouTube afterwards. So looking forward to seeing you logging in out there on a 
Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I've learned a lot. I'm usually not paying attention to insects that much because they are tiny stuff on the ground that we forget that they exist sometimes. So it was very insightful uh, on like very cool photos um, from you. That was very cool. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the questions afterwards. So I see a lot of folks have joined the, um, the Chaos Quiz. So we're going to be able to start shortly. Great. Well, I'm glad you learned something, Alexandra. That's awesome. Yeah. I always learn a lot of like topics that I did not expect often. So that's the pretty cool thing with uh, experimenting of your pens. It's always surprising me. Okay, so we're gonna start very very soon, like in a few seconds, uh, and it's in French. But the questions are gonna be in English, I swear. <laughs> okay, let's get started. So the first question is coming up quickly, and we're going to explore the field errors with Tyler today. So the first question is right or wrong. Some athletes have lived uh, birth without external eggs. So true is in blue, and wrong is in red. So according to you, some athletes have lived, have lived birth without external eggs. Is that right in blue or wrong uh, in red? Oh, I almost just blurted out the answer there. Yeah. So the answer is was right. You want to explain uh, us uh, what's up, Tyler? That's right. So they do have eggs, but the eggs are inside their body. Now, those aphids give birth to live young. And inside that first instar aphid nymph, she has live young ready to give birth when she's big enough. So... Yeah that initial aphid mother is actually carrying around her own grandchildren. That's impressive. Wow. OK. Uh, that was a uh, one mix, let's say, but the kind lady is ahead. OK. So now the question two. So it's a multiple choice answer. So what are some ways Tyler samples insects in fields? Oh, <laughs> Swap I I dropped this from my presentation. Oh no. Sorry not... about that. I did I did mention a couple things though. So on like birds can I catch birds on the wing and which on them or catch them with <laughs> the hand. So you can make a guess. Very mixed answer. So wanna give us Sorry. the right answer, Tyler? You know what? They're all right answers. <laughs> but I'm gonna go wow. with I'm gonna go with sweep nets as my number one answer. So if you remember that, check the net. That was a sweep net. And so we go out in the fields with a sweep net. And it's really hard to see insects when they're sitting on plants. But if you take that net and you swing it through the canopy and then you dump it into a bag or into a pail, you can see all of those insects that you caught. So you know what the pest insects are. And you can also look at the beneficial insects as well. So some of those pictures that I was showing you were from me just dumping that sweep net getting up close and personal with my camera and taking a picture like that green lacewing adult eating the pea aphids. Awesome. Well, interesting techniques, I have to say. <laughs> but sometimes I will get in there and just grab those insects by hand if need be. The bigger, the bigger ones, I guess, that you can just grab. The bigger them. ones, sure. Okay, so question three now. Bringing in predator insects can help curb the impact of aphids. Is that right in blue or brown in red. So bringing in predator insects can help curb the impact of aphids. True in blue and wrong in red. So what do you folks think? Most people said it was true and that's the right answer. Good, good work. That is the right answer. So if you remember, I mentioned 135 aphids in a day. That's what one of those seven spotted lady beetles can eat. And so when they move into a crop, they can decimate the aphid population. Wow, that's really impressive. Okay, so now we have an iguana leading. Okay, so last question is also right or wrong. Wait, there are insects that lay their eggs inside living things. Is that right in blue or wrong in red? So what do you folks think about that? The insects that lay their eggs inside living things. Oh, 
And the answer was right. And most people got it. Good. That was true. You remember that's a special kind of predator called a parasitoid. And the parasitoid, it is the offspring of that parasitic wasp that winds up killing that pest insect. Sounds good. Right, so that was the last question. So kudos to the top um, three that get, they, they get the royal right chicken in third. The third. Uh, Kai Iguana taking up second. Yeah, and then leading the podium was the kind Yeti. Uh, like, the kind you all, yeti. And thank you for playing with us. That was very fun. I've loved well done, everyone. I hope you did too. So that was pretty cool. And now we're going to take questions that people send on YouTube. So someone was asking what was the most gross <laughs> moment of your career? The most gross moment. Oh, boy. I'm going to tell you one that maybe you'll think is gross, but I thought it was really cool. So <laughs> I was... <try> that. <laughs> Yeah, so I was teaching a class, and I was showing off a green lacewing larva to the class. We were right in the field, so we had used a sweep net. We had caught these green lacewings, and I said, hey, check this out. It's a green lacewing larva. And that green lacewing larva bit my hand right in front of everybody. And it didn't yeah. hurt at first, but it started to sting after a little while because it was trying to digest me. It was injecting a digestive enzyme into my hand. And oh. so... I pulled it off at that point, and it probably stung for about a good half hour afterwards. Such a small thing, attacking such a big one like yours. I know. I don't no, know what it was. Scared. thinking. <laughs> I mean, that's a big, that's a big meal to digest. That's right. I don't think it would have been very successful. <laughs> Sounds cool. Um, I mean, cool. Like, I don't really want to leave that through, but that's a cool story. <laughs> So someone was asking for a scientific name. I think it was during the video with the wasp. Mm. So that wasp, uh, the one that was attacking the aphids, that is Aphidius avinaphis. And so when we make a scientific name, we use Latin because it's a dead language and it doesn't change. And so what we found was Aphidius avinaphis was basically the only parasitoid in Western Canada that was attacking these aphids. And so I was expecting to see a few other aphidias and maybe some other genus of parasitic wasp as well. But really, we just got the one. Cool, thank you. So another question that we have right there, someone is asking, why are they important for the ecosystem? And once again, I think that was related to the video with the wasp. Yeah, well, they're important for the ecosystem to try to keep those pest insects in check. So like we saw with aphids, they give birth to live young and their populations can blow up, can just explode. And so that swamps the ecosystem. So the parasitic wasps help to keep the ecosystem in check by taking out aphids. Great. Um, speaking of aphids, someone was asking what are the pros and the cons of aphids? Pros and cons. Yep. Right. Pros. <laughs> I get to work on them. <laughs> How about that? Um, they're a really good study organism for a few other things. But really, there's not a whole lot of pros to an aphid. It's uh, it's bad news for every plant that it's on. Right. Um, uh, let's go the pro, though. Pro. Aphids are like the cows of the insect world. They just sit there, and things come along and eat them. So they are... Uh, they're food for a lot of things. Now, you may have heard of ants that milk aphids. So that's another way that they're kind of like cows. So the ants will come along and they will use their antennae and the aphid will release a drop of honeydew, which is basically the phloem of the plant that they're drinking. And it's highly sugary. And off goes the aphid with this drop of honeydew. Wow. I would have never expected that. That's it doesn't happen in all systems, but it happens in a couple of systems, and it's very cool. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Someone is wondering, how big are the Cotesia clusters? Oh, the Cotesia clusters are about the same size as your typical caterpillar. So, hmm. Let's see. What is Probably that? about the size of a USB thumb drive, about this big, let's say. Like, like this big, I feel like, right? Maybe like about half the size of your lip balm. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's smaller. Okay. So yeah. Like and so we get a lot of questions about those. So people will send me a picture and they'll say, hey, 
what are these eggs on my barley or on my wheats? And I say, ah, those are way too big to be insect eggs. I wouldn't want to see the insect that comes out of those. So I say, those are the pupae of Cotesia or another parasitic wasp. Sounds good. Okay, I think that it's uh, all the questions that we have for today. It was very cool. Thank you for sending those. It was very interesting. And I think that we've learned a lot. So I want to thank you all and Tyler as well for his time. And it was very insightful. And I've learned so much with insects from those heroes that we often undermine. So thank you so much again. And once again, um, you can find the, the, the teacher kit using this link that I'm going to share again. So it's right there. It should be popping up soon. Oh, here it is. Oh, it's gone. OK. It's back right there. there it is. So you can find the Edwin Teacher Travel Kit there. Uh, and don't forget that our final event is tomorrow at 10.30 AM Eastern. So we can wrap up our cross Canada exploration with our field trip to a secret location. So thank you so much to everyone that, for joining today, whether you are live or catching up on YouTube later. It was very, very cool to have you with us today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the program and learned a lot. And I want to thank Tyler again for his time and for all the super cool videos and photos. Very intriguing and always super interesting. So You're thank welcome you. and thank you for having me. Thank you to everyone for listening. That was, a, that was the last question. You want to take it? <laughs> yeah, let's see it. Space is the place is asking, what was your favorite part about studying aphids on insects? My favorite part, I think, is when the natural enemies started to eat the aphids. And I was right there and ready with a microscope camera to start making videos. I think that's my favorite part. Perfect. I'm glad that we could get a last question to wrap that up. And thank you so much for joining. Have a good day, you all. And don't forget tomorrow, the special event, Life on the Trip. It was a pleasure. Bye. Bye.